Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Chris, please okay. go ahead. Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm Chris Love. I'm in the School of Environment and Science, and uh, I mostly teach uh, biochemistry and molecular biology. Um, I've got a background in biochemistry and chemistry. Um, I did my um, PhD at ANU and then a couple of postdocs overseas, uh, the second one at Oxford, and then I came back here and I've been teaching here at Griffith now for about 16 years and mostly first year biochemistry and second year biochemistry. So what I'd like to talk to you today, and I thought this might be appropriate for not just the sciences, but what I've done in my first year biochemistry course in relation to building a digital journal might actually be something that some of those large foundation first year courses in engineering, um, it could uh, uh, be applicable across any of those. So what I did was um, a couple of years ago, I started to think about how I could improve learning in one of these big first year courses that had quite a high fail rate. And so I was looking for ways to support learning and what we could do. And then obviously COVID came along and that had an effect as well. And, and in terms of the fact that many students have more responsibility for their own learning once we went online and managing their time is something that particularly first year students uh, and some of those lower level students in the class probably really struggle with keeping up with the content, particularly in these large first year courses that have high content. So what I'd like to talk to you about today is a digital learning journal that I've actually put together across a couple of years to support uh, self-regulated learning in students and help them navigate that large amount of complex content and in a large first year course. So I'll tell you a little bit about that. So the way it started was um, I took over this course, first year biochemistry course as the convener in 2019 when, when another academic left the university. And the course I'd been teaching since I started, aspects of it, uh, but I never convened it. And over those couple of years prior to 2019, the fail rates had gone through the roof. Uh, we'd had a big influx of students as our programs got uncapped. And then we had lots more lower level learners in the class and the fail rates ballooned out to, to quite high. So I decided that we needed to make sure that we we're supporting learning. And so I decided to, um, after looking around some of the literature, we came up with some ideas about introducing personal learning plans or study plans into first year courses. And I know we all think that students are coming into our university with some of these skills already, but some of these students that are first in family don't always have all of these skills. So maybe it's worth cutting a little bit of content to actually embed study skills to actually support students uh, having a better success rates. So I, in 2019, I added um, these personal learning plans, and I built them into PebblePad, which is a digital learning platform, uh, personalized, so the students can actually do evaluations of their own sort of performance in, in assessment, and then they can reflect on how they've gone in that assessment. So I did that in 2019, and I'll tell you about that, the outcomes of that, and then I'll move on to what I did in 2019, uh, sorry, in 2020, to help support students through that COVID online. And I made sure when I was building something that it was something that is gonna be used regardless of whether we're online or face-to-face. -face. So we want something that, I don't wanna spend a whole lot of time developing something, not to use it beyond uh, you know, that year of COVID-19. And so what we decided to do was that to actually take the study plans in PebblePad, add biochemistry, tasks into that journal that the students had to do on a weekly basis and then also embed our assignments within that platform and it meant that there's one place that they go and do all their non-exam based assessment so that can be really useful in sort of helping students organize um, there so i'm going to take you through firstly the study plans and the outcomes of those that we that we ran in 2019 and then i'll talk about the redevelopments we did in 2020 and I've got a multitude of data here, which I haven't even had a chance to completely go through 
um, and do a, a, a real thematic, um, you know, research analysis of it. But um, I'll tell you about some of the things that we've we've identified as we go. Okay, oh, just a little bit of context about the course. So first year biochemistry generally runs in the second half of first year, although we still have some commencing students that pick this up without the basic chemistry, which creates its own little uh, problems. There's about three to 400 students um, each year, and that fluctuates obviously, depending on um, the number of um, enrollments that we have. It's got a large amount of content and it also has some quite complex uh, concepts that the students need to navigate across chemistry and biochemistry. And, and if they're lacking any of that uh, background knowledge coming into the course, then they do tend to struggle. Uh, back in 2019, before COVID, we generally would uh, deliver the course as a combination of um, lectures and lectorials but they were whole class. And I'll get to that in a moment because this came about uh, over time as the course changed uh, with enrolments and as the university wanted to save money and uh, look at the ways that we teach, we, we've sort of, this course changed quite a bit. And I think it led to some of those higher fail rates that we've got. Um, and now I'm trying to counteract that as I've, I've taken over as the convener of the course. So one of the biggest problems we faced um, was that, um, sorry, was that we firstly saw a decline in student success rates. So in 27 and 28, 2017 and 2018, the fail rates in this course were 37 and 38%. And that's far too high. I mean, we want to get those down. I do expect that, you know, I'm, I'm really a stickler for quality and I don't think we can just pass people and make the courses easier. I think we really have to st support the learning, but maintain the standards that we need. So if we drop our standards, even in first year courses, that has a consequence to second and third year courses. And surely we want high quality students leaving the university with degrees. And, and we want those Griffith students to go out there and prove to um, you know, their employees that, that the degrees coming from Griffith are worthwhile and, and, and of high quality and that they have the skills to do those, those jobs well. So there were a few things that happened. Those high fail rates, I think they were a combination coming from the replacement of our small problem-based tutorials. So this class used to have small tutorials of about 25 to 30, um, but as the class sizes increased, the university decided to cut those out because that was, wasn't a cost-effective way of teaching the course. Because if you can imagine, if you've got 400 students, uh, you're running 20 of these um, uh, classes, um, 20 to 25 uh, pro small problem-based classes every couple of weeks. And, and you've got to find tutors for that. The sessional budget must has got to be a lot higher and, and so on. But at the same time, not only did we go to these whole class tutorials, um, we also shortened the trimesters. So we went first, when we introduced trimesters, they were 13 weeks, they're now at 12 weeks. But also what we've done here at Griffith is we've also cut study week. It's not a full week anymore. It's only three days. And then our exam block, which used to be across two weeks, is now only across about 10 days. So these have all contributed, to, I think, to the, the reduction in success rates in this course. And obviously, we've also seen a decline in lecture attendance. So this, is, this has happened over time since lecture catcher started. Uh, I can't remember exactly what year. Um, we introduced lecture capture and all the, all the courses became recorded. But this is actually a class from 2018. This is about four weeks into the class when I had over 400 students enrolled and I was probably getting about 10 to 15% if that coming to the lectures. And if we're doing the, the problem-based questions within those large uh, lectorial type situation, if you don't have the students there, they don't know how to do the problems, uh, yes, they might be able to access the recordings later, 
but you can't ask questions to a recording. So it really creates a problem if you have no attendance and you're doing these large tutorial based type classes. So that was a real struggle in terms of how we fix the problem. Um, the other thing to look at, it's worth, I always look at the demographic of my students every year. Uh, and in this course, we're, we're somewhere around 50% of students that are first in family. So those ones that don't have anybody else in their family to support them because they're the first uh, in their family to come to university. And we also, if you look closely, you also find that some of these large first year courses, they do have a high proportion of students that um, speak English as a second language. So the language they speak at home is not English. And so therefore that can create some problems, particularly around how they communicate uh, and write and these sorts of things that, that also um, has an impact. And what's even more interesting is when I looked at some of the demographics, you can usually have a look at the students' GPAs. And when I looked this year, this is prior, uh, I think this is 2019 data here. And we found that almost 50% of the students by the time they reached trimester two, had a GPA less than four, which suggests that they've failed at least one course in trimester one. So um, that's a real problem, I think, if we're already seeing that students are having a little bit of a problem in trimester one, they're going into another heavy content, difficult course in trimester two, um, and we've got that problem coming through. Now, I think this is a consequence of, of some of the level of some of the students coming into the university or whether they're not able to cope with um, the large amount of content across four courses. Um, when I was a program director, I used to regularly suggest to students to cut their loads back to 30 credit points because that's still full time and they might be able to manage 30 credit points better than 40, uh, particularly as we've gone into these slightly shorter trimesters. Um, but anyway, I mean, these, I think, of, are things that I've just identified in that student demographic each year that we've currently got these problems that we need to help um, try and fix in some way or be able to support these people a little bit better within the course so that they can get through and be successful. So the first thing I did was think about introducing study plans and it came about through conversations with um, uh, Julie Croft who's the learning and teaching uh, consultant um, for curriculum within the sciences group and we'd identified a couple of publications where they had identified study strategies um, that improve student performance in assessment and we were thinking about how we could take some of those study strategies and get students to incorporate those into their learning. And I came up with this idea about, could we build a study plan and use it not only to get the students to produce a plan of how they're gonna study from one assessment item to the next, but also put in some reflections and an evaluation so that we can get them to evaluate their performance. So, I think reflections are really important. If you ask a student, well, what did you do wrong in that exam? Could you have done it better? Could you have studied better leading up to it? They'll all probably reflect on that and say, yeah, well, I probably didn't do as much study as I should have, or there was a practice quiz there, but I didn't really do it. I did it once and thought I'll be okay. So it's not, the reality is not until I've done the actual test and they haven't performed as well. Um, so I now have them Prior to doing the study plan, we asked them a few questions about their first online quiz and asked them how they went. So um, what were we trying to achieve by this? We wanted to see how we could, how can we improve student success in our course? Do students entering the university have the actual study skills or the study strategies that they need to be successful? And some of the data that came out of this study um, we'd have to say no, we, they, not all the students coming to university have got the appropriate skills that they need to get through. And should study skills then be incorporated into the curricula within a course rather than discipline content? And there's probably lots of arguments around uh, different people around this type of thing. 
uh, there's probably many academics that say, no, we should be just focused on the discipline. But there's others that probably say, hey, these students don't have these skills. We, if we don't introduce them now in first year, you know, we're not helping them progress and transition through the university to higher level years. So, so these are the questions that are really important, I think, to, to why we need to come up with different strategies to support learning. So these are a couple of the uh, the publications that we were looking at, and and um, I've got to credit Julie who who actually directed me towards these first couple of ones about improving student learning through effective learning techniques and um, examining the habits of undergraduate students. And these are in STEM courses. So STEM courses, I think, sometimes that that element of problem-based learning that we have and everything is really important. We actually teach our students to be able to solve problems and be critical and analyze data and all that sort of stuff. And Julie and I, through other projects that we've done together, have always been interested in seeing how we can sort of support students in regulating their own learning. So self-regulation, which is really important and, and helping them help themselves in a fact to improve in their own uh, performance as they go through university. So we, what we did was these first two papers actually listed the most effective uh, strategies for student learning that actually improve performance. And so what we thought we would do is could we then simplify these for the students and then get them to incorporate this within a study plan. Okay, so, so what we did is I took, I went through these two publications. I took out the six, top, the top six learning strategies um, that they had said improved performance. And then I, I simplified them just into bullet points to give the students a bit of idea of if that's a learning, if a learning strategy, is self-evaluation, what does that involve? Well, you can check the progress of your own work. You can monitor understanding of some of the material in your course. You can address and clarify where your, your knowledge gaps are, okay? So I just put it into simple terms so the students could look down and think, oh yeah, this might be a strategy that fits with how I might want to you know, study this course. And so I can work my way through that. So the students needed to uh, embed two of these strategies in two of these learning strategies into their study plan going forward. And then they had to produce a one page study plan. I'll show you some examples in a moment. Okay, so, um, and I'll, what I'll do also is um, partway through the talk, I'm gonna stop and I'll take you through the learning journal in Pebblepad and show you the different aspects of it so that you can get an idea of how I set it out. Okay, <clears throat> and the self-regulated learning, I think, is really fits into this well, because if we can set up the journal, uh, our learning journal and study plans in a way that, that students can help build plans and help understand material and help them manage their time through a course and through a high level of content, then they're going to come out better and they're still going to be start thinking about how they're learning themselves through that process. Certainly in first year, it's harder and it's harder for students to manage their time. They're probably not very good at that. Uh, online, uh, going online and teaching remotely, I don't think that has actually supported that at all. I think it's made it more difficult for students. And I think if we sit back as academics and understand, you know, all of the issues that we have with teaching online ourselves, the students, I think we also got to consider that those students have got major problems in uh, remote learning and the majority of students that I talk to uh, don't necessarily enjoy it so well and um, how we, we sort of can improve that um, is, is another question in itself. But in terms of managing their time through a course, I think being able to build a journal where they have you know, things that they have to do on a weekly or basis or whatever can help support them moving through the content and help their time management and support it. And this is what this journal is a little bit about. So in terms of the study plans, our approach was, can we 
uh, embed these learning strategies into the course, get students reflect on their performance uh, and evaluate how they've gone so that they can then think about how they can create a study plan that can support their learning or improvements to the next assessment. So students, after they do the first online quiz, um, their study plan section in, in their digital journal will open. They get a chance to go in there and evaluate their performance. So how well did you go on the quiz? Um, and then they have to create a study plan um, that to either maintain or improve their performance. And then after the second quiz, I will get them to evaluate again and go, did they improve? Did you maintain your grades and so on? And so then after the second quiz, they can create a, a second study plan, uh, preparing them for the final exam at the end of the trimester. But each time they use these, uh, they develop a study plan, they have to incorporate two of those learning strategies and they have to sort of outline how they've, in, how they've put those into that study plan. The study plans are simple. I only ask them to do it on one A4 sheet of paper um, and I communicate to them what they need to do. And it's studying from, it's their plan from quiz one to when they complete quiz two. And after quiz two, then they create the new plan to study for the end of trimester exam. And at that point, when they're doing their second study plan, I also encourage them that they might want to change the strategies they're using because we have online quizzes with a multiple choice. The final exam has short answer questions. Uh, so they, and, and also the quizzes only, uh, only cover part of the course, but the final exam covers the whole course content. So it's important for them to think, hey, don't forget, you can change these strategies around. You might want to add some reviewing previous content from back in week one into your study plan going forward from week eight until week 12 for the end of trimester exam. Okay, and these sorts of things. When we were setting the study plans up, there were a couple of really important things that we wanted to do, apart from just improving their performance, we wanted to provide a safe environment um, and a safe space for students to write those reflections because they're not going to do it if everybody else can see it. So those digital platforms are really important. And at the same time that I was doing this was when the scientist group was offering some uh, financial support to people who are using PebblePad because the university had invested in PebblePad uh, as a way for students to generate assets that they could use for employability beyond their degree and so on. There was a way here to get some funding to actually, um, you know, promote um, PebblePad and using that particular online platform for students to do their uh, study plans and their reflections. The other thing is we also wanted to make it add some assessment to uh, add some grade weighting to it because if you don't add if there was no assessment attached if it was no grade uh, contribution to their final grades within this study plans then they none of the students would do it we all know that we can put up extra resources to help student learning but if uh, many of them go unused because the students can't see any value in it I don't get any marks for doing it. Yes, it might help me learn, but, you know, um, so we wanted to put some sort of grades, um, some sort of uh, weighting towards their final grade. So in the end, we, for the study plans, it became 10% uh, of their final grades and non-graded assessment. So this, so that incorporated, they had to complete it. And that in, included reflections and evaluations. So they completed all the, reflections, evaluation questions, completed their study plans, they got 10%. And I was worried that this might affect their final grades and it might be just pushing students up that might not have actually got up um, originally. But in actual fact, it doesn't because my final end of trimester exam has a hurdle. And so unless they can meet that hurdle on the final exam, they're not gonna get through that stage. And if people don't meet that hurdle, but they might have, might have actually passed the course because of this non-graded assessment, they, they then are eligible to sit a supplementary exam. And so they could still get through that, that way. But uh, it was really important that I thought that, you know, I didn't want to add 10% non-graded 
assessment and have that allowing students to pass a course that they may not pass. Because I'm still, as I said earlier, quality uh, is really important and students need to be able to, um, to, to perform on that final exam and show that they understand enough of the content um, to get their grades get through. Uh, so how did it work? We basically set up the workbook in PebblePad and I'll show you a, an example later on. Um, so what did they have to do? They first had to evaluate and reflect on their performance after the first quiz and create a study plan to improve or maintain their grades going forward. The study plans um, incorporated two of the learning strategies. And after the second quiz, they get to do a second round of evaluation and reflection, and they create a study plan for the final exam. And built into that, uh, a really good thing I learned a few years ago when I, when I moved across to um, uh, a teaching focused position, and I was trying to get data to publish in scholarship journals and things like that, I realized that I didn't have much data Every time now, the good thing about using something like PebblePad is that you can incorporate, or at least I incorporate an evaluation of anything new that I do. If I'm using this platform, I added an evaluation in here. And the information that you can get um, is pretty amazing because you, if you're asking students to write reflections, um, then you can use the information they're putting in, into those reflections to get a direct uh, insight into the student thinking around uh, what you're doing. And you can use that uh, information through reflections and evaluations to, to then generate data for teaching and learning publications and for dissemination of your practices and so on. And even for awards and citations, if you're interested in applying for those. So it's a great way to generate data. So now for each of my courses that I use PebblePad for, I build in the evaluations um, and I have ethics applications that allow me to, to use the artifacts and, and those sorts of things. So it's not a difficult process to get an ethics application for using the data uh, that's collected through these courses. I suppose the big question was, was this uh, approach successful? Um, well, we think that definitely it was. So I'll give you some of the stats and things that we found out through our evaluations. So when I look at the reflections, we've just got so many reflections that are positive reflections about the importance of the study plan, how well it helped them and so on. So we've got all those positive reflections. One of the other things that we thought was, was really amazing was a lot of our plans, they were amazing how creative they were, how elaborate, and some of them are very quite detailed, uh, which can be a problem as well if they've made a plan that's too detailed and they haven't considered other courses um, that they're studying for at the same time. So we're aware of that and it came up in some of the reflections uh, as well. Um, improvements in quiz results. So if we looked at uh, when students were evaluating their quiz, so 71% percent of students actually improved or maintained their grades from the first quiz to the second, which we think is a pretty good achievement. If we're getting 30% 30, 30 of the people that are improving their grades, then I think, think we're on a winner. So um, that was great. Um, and there was about 66% of the class that actually attributed uh, their improvement in grades to the study plan. So that again gave us good confidence that we we're going in the right direction by getting students to develop these plans and getting them to think about where they went wrong on their exam and how they could improve it. Uh, in the end, for the course in 2019, we're actually managed to get the fail rate down to 27%. So that's down almost 10% from what it was in 2018 and 2017. So we thought that was a really exciting as well. We've improved the success rates of the students in the class without compromising the quality, but through introducing a range of study strategies uh, to support those. Uh, these are just some snapshots of some of the study plans and I could show you hundreds of really nice plans, but there's one or two here. You can see this person, they've, they've have their two 
um, strategies up here at the top and they're highlighted. And then as they put their, um, their plan together, you can see that they've highlighted their different strategies in different colors there. So it's easy to coordinate. And hopefully they're saying they want to get a good grade or a good mark. So that was good. So that's one. So this is a, I told them they could just hand draw it. I had exemplars in there. The first year I just sat down and created a plan, put it up and said, you can do one like this, or you could do it a, a different way. It was completely up to them how they wanted to do it. So they had their quiz in week four, then they did their plan from week four and they had their second quiz in week nine. Um, this was in um, 2019. Here's another plan. I thought this one was really quite a nice plan. And this is one for studying for the end of trimester exam now. So after their quiz in week nine, then they're moving on to then preparing for that end of trimester exam. Um, and you can see here, they've listed the things that they're doing within their plan and what they're doing each week and factoring in some revision and so on. So there were all sorts of different plans that we got, whether they were done um, you know, using a computer and different programs or whether they were just handwritten. Um, but it doesn't really matter. And for me, it was about planting the seed to think about your study. And if they put a bit of effort into doing a plan and if they stuck to it along the way, then they'd probably improve their grades. So um, the most of those were pretty, pretty good. In terms of the experience, I mean, I've got lots of comments like this. Um, my experience in creating a study plan allowed me to identify my own strengths and weaknesses, strategies that work for me in learning and revising work. And I could show you so many um, comments in this sort of vein that came out of our, our workbook and out of the students' reflections. Uh, as usual with any of these things, not everybody, um, not everybody enjoyed them. They're not all happy about um, doing certain things. So there was a few people that said, you know, um, didn't really, wasn't really helpful for me, uh, didn't really help me learn. Um, there were a couple of students that said, oh, look, I've done study plans before. I know how to do them. I do them all the time anyway. Um, and so there's always going to be, you can never, in a big course like uh, this one, you can never please 100% of the people 100% of the time. But I think in this case, we've, we had more, far more positive comments than the few negative ones. And so that's still, we got to just, uh, I think it's just a matter of accepting that it's not a perfect world. And so, you know, not all of the students are going to enjoy every little thing that you do. Um, but you do your best to try and support most of them. I think the most surprising find um, from the data that we collected was that just almost 61% of students had commented that they'd never developed a study plan for a course before. And that was either at with, at another university or at school, it was mind boggling to me that they hadn't done this. Maybe they just haven't identified that they have done sort of some sort of plans in the past and haven't called them a plan. But it seems such a high number that, uh, that I was just sort of gobsmacked when I looked at that data and thought, surely they've done a study plan somewhere before. I'd like to just um, take you to one of the undergraduate students that did the course in uh, 2019. This is just a quick reflection from her, uh, her perspective about what she thought um, of the study plans in 2019. How's it gonna run? Oh. Excellent. It worked perfectly before when I tested it prior to the start of the um, start of the um, the talk, um, but I'm not sure why it's not working now. Okay, I'll, I'm going to have to skip across that. Hopefully, I can 
I'll I'll get it working and I can put the slides up if if people are interested. But uh, Shay was one of those students that sort of said, "Oh, I wasn't really sure about those study plans when I first did them," but but then she realised um, the importance of them and it did probably plant the seed and help her uh, move along uh, to those to to doing um, better in the course than she might have planned. Some of the other interesting insights that came out when we looked at doing a bit of a thematic um, analysis of this is we really unearthed some, some a lot of issues affecting um, people not being able to commit to their study plans. So we, we noticed in one of our evaluation questions, we asked students if they completed or fully enacted their plan. There was only about 7.7% that actually said they fully enacted plans. And then they had to sort of comment why. And so there's all these range of issues that were going on within the class about why they couldn't stick to their study plans, workload in other courses, assessment for other courses, work commitment, time management, all these things. And I was also surprised at the level of mental health that I've seen in some of these um, young students that are coming into first year that um, are really struggling, uh, particularly online, I think has made it worse. But we noticed all of these things that were going on um, within, within these reflections. So it gave us a bit of an insight to, you know, more of an insight into what was going on with some of the students in the course that might have been struggling. And what did we learn from it? Um, probably learned a lot of things. Uh, a large proportion of students uh, entering university without, probably without the necessary skills to be successful, particularly many of those first in family and lower level learners that are coming into the, to the university. Um, we need to use um, methods that develop students' metacognitive skills. We certainly need to, to get them to think about um, how they're learning and how they can improve their performance. Um, I probably realized also, I could have given them some more information about their study plan. Some of them made their study plans too complicated, too, too involved, and they hadn't considered other aspects of the course or, or their extracurricular um, activities and things. And so they weren't able to finish their plans because they, they hadn't factored in ex everything else that was going on within their lives. And I think it's not just being able to uh, time manage within the course, you need to be able to time manage across um, you know, your other duties, whether it's work or, um, or so on, or other courses. So, so we clearly need to communicate to them uh, some of these other skills as we go. So when we got to last year in COVID-19, I decided to restructure the course because I realized that this large first year course was gonna be a struggle uh, online. It's gonna be hard for students to manage their time, particularly through all the content uh, we know I, I'd even noticed the students struggling in trimester one um, in my second year course. So I thought definitely got to do something to, to compensate. So I was trying to think about how can we enhance and maintain uh, student participation and engagement online. It's a real problem. Um, some students, in fact, engage better through chats online. Uh, but I had nightmares when I tried to run short um, breakout rooms uh, in courses where students had logged onto the class, but then they're off doing something else. So we had all these range of problems going on. Um, what strategies could we also support remote learning? And this is where I came up with the idea that we needed to have, you know, there need to be weekly tasks the students needed to keep up with so that they could manage their way through that content. Um, and what support could we offer to ensure we get success in the course? Oh. So we did a couple of things. I'm really only gonna talk about part three here. Um, so the first thing we did was I broke up the course into weekly topics. And in actual fact, uh, you can see here, there's a couple of pictures I've got there of week two and week three. In their learning journals that they see down that I'll go through in a minute, I've actually used the same pictures from their course content page with their weekly uh, information. 
I've used the same ones for their weekly biochemistry exercises in the learning journal. Um, so we broke it up into weekly installments, um, pre-recorded lectures, and then online problem-based learning. We set up a social network in Teams and I used channels in Teams to get social interaction between students because a lot of them hadn't even met each other in the class yet. And another channel which we could use to discuss biochemistry and people could post questions and whatever. So I won't really talk about those today because I want to focus on our learning journal, which we decided to take from the year before, from 2019 with our study plans build in weekly exercises in biochemistry that they needed to complete. And these problem-based exercises that they needed to do in their journal on a weekly basis were aligned with the weekly set of tutorial questions, which we covered in an online class. So they could see how these questions were done in our class and then had similar questions that they had to do uh, as a part of their assessment in their learning journal. We still had the study plans and the evaluation and reflections uh, in that um, workbook. And the other thing we did was actually embed our assignments in there so that they only had one online platform, which all this assessment was done. And the assessment for this then meant this learning journal was worth 50% of the course. Weekly biochemistry exercises were worth 10%, the study plans were 10%, and two assignments worth 15% each. So you can see here, this is just shows a quick picture of, of one of the pages, but I'll open it up. I'll show you, I'll share my screen with you in a minute and show you the other ones. But you can see here's our weekly topics with week 12 as revision. And in each topic, not only, it's not just a set of problems they do. I've gone in there and built this journal so that there are concepts embedded in there. There are figures that's, um, sorry, figures in there to help them. Uh, that support those concepts. So they're not just getting a set of questions, they're getting some content as well. So I've used some of the textbook resources to populate uh, my learning journal. And you can see here, here's a couple of comments that were really favorable about that learning journal and doing those weekly tasks, particularly, you know, it kept me accountable for my learning, uh, which they found difficult online or it helped them consolidate and revise over the weekly knowledge. So we had lots and lots again of really good supporting comments. Um, we had the problem based assignments built in there and I've been recently trying to personalize assignments. So the first assignment they do in there, they actually have to create a peptide from their name, which means that they can't just copy off anybody else. Uh, and the second kinetics assignment this year, we're giving them different data sets. So not all students will have the same set of data to try and just mitigate uh, copying within there. But I've really just put those there to say, you know, this journal incorporated all of these things. Okay, let's um, see if this one of Shays is going to work. No, it's not going to work. All right, sorry that my embedded videos haven't worked. Um, Okay, so what would the, I think what I'll do now, I'm just gonna stop sharing this and I'm gonna go and share one of the workbooks with you and then I'll come back to what um, those last couple of slides are. All right. All right, let me find it. Um, can you see my screen there okay? Yes, I can see it, Chris. Yeah. Oh, you can see the learning journal? Excellent. Uh, okay. I can see only your PowerPoint presentation. Oh, sorry. I'll have to... Sorry, I'm not as familiar with Zoom. Um, I'll yeah, just me too. <laughs> change the... Where's my share? Oh, there's my share, and I'll share... Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is that working now? Yes. It All does. right. Okay. So, um, so this is just my Pebble Pad learning journal. I don't know whether everybody's familiar with Pebble Pad, but you can set up worksheets uh, and workbooks. 
So this has got several aspects to it. You can see, if you look over on this side, you can see I've got an introduction which gives um, all the information about the learning journal. And then we have across the top, you can see here that there's weekly exercises, uh, a study plans, and then there's assessment. And so what they do is they can, first, if we have a look at the weekly plans, you can see there's just a drop down here. And each one of these is a, um, is a worksheet or a workbook. So if they open it up, you can see here, it tells them what they're doing week three. It has some pictures and some uh, information in it. And then they get a series of questions. So, you know, whether it's um, here, it's just providing an answer, um, a couple of definitions, but then they have to hand draw some structures. So here they have to hand draw structures and then they upload those as an image file, um, ask them to sort of write out codes for amino acids. So this is all biochemistry things. Different exercises in each, each sheet, but the the weekly ones that we do here are aligned with the weekly tutorial questions in the online class. So they can sort of cross reference between the two. And it's a combination of information that I've added here, uh, plus questions that they need to answer and, and things that they need to upload. And again, you know, here, this is um, structures and working out uh, calculations is really important. So we can go through any one of these types of um, uh, weeks and they will have problems that they need to do and upload. And you can see here some of the calculations they're doing for enzyme kinetics. Um, but also there's information here that I've provided with that supports their learning and they've got the draw curves and do plots and all that sort of thing. So the weekly exercises, uh, they're designed to cover all the week, weekly topics and to make it easier and for easier to visual cross-reference, uh, the pictures on the top of these match the pictures on their, um, on their course contents on the Learning at Griffith site. Then we have our study plans. Um, and again, uh, here's where they come in and after one of the quizzes, they assess their performance. So they have to sort of um, select, rate their performance first. Then they write a reflection um, on how they went. And I've asked them to also tell me what strategies they've used prior to. And then here's where I list the different learning strategies that there's six of them here that they then need to incorporate into their study plan. So here's this student's uh, study plan. And again, they've highlighted with colors the, the different strategies that they've incorporated and, and so on. And then they come to their assignments. Their assignments are in here as well. And again, some of these complement some of the activities they had to do in their weeks because they've again, have to be able to then, um, you know, draw structures of peptides be able to work out calculations um, and plot data and, and graphs. So it puts it all into, um, you know, uh, one platform where they can visualize um, uh, or do all of these assessment tasks. Okay, and again, whether it's drawing models and uploading them, uh, analyzing data, graphing it and uploading the graphs and so on. Okay, so that just gives you an insight to the learning journal, how we've set it up, the different aspects of it. Um, the two assignments are graded, the weekly activities in the study plan are non graded. And um, the students, in particularly for the weekly tasks, they have to complete each question. If they leave any questions blank, certainly they lose marks for that. And what I do is provide, I have three checkpoints across the trimester. And after each checkpoint, I actually provide um, feedback to certain questions, particularly the difficult ones, so they can go back and then fix their answers. So I'm encouraging them all the time to fix their answers up if they've made a mistake and to, and to look at my feedback to see where they might have made their errors and so on. So there's lots of encouragement throughout the trimester to do that. Okay, I'm gonna go back and, and share my slides again. I just thought I'd give you a little bit of an insight to the journal. because I just realized we're, we're running out of time. 
So what were the outcomes here um, in terms of um, our evaluation? We found that about 71.8% of the students thought that the learning journal was effective in supporting their learning. Um, about 70% uh, rated the weekly tasks as the most uh, as really successful in effectively supporting their learning. 57% said the activities helped them, um, helped manage their way through uh, the course content. So that was one of the things that were really important to us is getting the students to try and do things weekly and keeping up with all the content rather than getting into week four or five and then being five weeks behind and trying to catch up. You can't do it. Uh, they really liked the fact that the all of the assess all of the study plans, weekly exercises were all in one online journal. So they had to go to one place to do all this assessment, which they really liked. And overall, we saw a slight improvement again in the overall success rate. So our fail rates down in 2020 dropped down to 24%. So we've now got them back to what they used to be um, uh, prior to those years uh, when we had our small tutorials that I talked about earlier. What are some of the take home messages? Um, I think it's really important to include reflections. A student reflections, get them to think about what they're doing and why they're doing it. If you can do that and they provide a reflection that gives you a direct insight and it makes you as, a, as an academic, maybe identify some of the barriers to students' success and how we can improve students. One of the smartest things I ever did with reflections is make them a minimum of 20 words. This is a science course. Students don't want to spend 200 words reflecting, but I can tell you that by making it 20 words, it's about one sentence. And if students got something to say, they will say it. I've got reflections from my learning journal that are about um, three quarters of a page to a page long from one student. So we've got these amazing reflections. Um, and I've got a lot of students that just said, yeah, I found this the study plan successful and they helped me through the course. So you get both types. So just expect that you're going to get that. But I think if you if I said to the students they had to write a 200 word reflection, I think most of them would be leave, leaving those uh, reflections blank. Um, any of these things need assessment weighting. If you don't have weight the assessment, then certainly they won't they won't be invested in doing it. So you need an appropriate amount of assessment um, for uh, getting the students to do it and do it well. Um, I use a lot of the reflections and the evaluations that for all of these tasks to actually, you know, do research into student learning and, and publish um, a lot of the data that I get uh, from that. Um, and so it's a great way to collect a lot of data um there's a there is also a um a faculty spark that was done by sarah creswell in our in our school that talked about uh the importance of pebble pad for generating data for uh research into student learning and the other good thing about it is always have a safe space where students can actually do those reflections so pebble pad's really good i can access their their reflections, but nobody else sees them. So it's only shared between that and they're all stored in a safe place and so on. Uh, just a few acknowledgements. Uh, I do a lot of work with Julie Croft, who's our teaching and learning consultant, and we've published a lot of stuff together. Our Pebble Pad uh, people, Chris Allen and David Green, they're fantastic in, in helping me and supporting me. Shai was our undergraduate student. She's also a past leader and it's just a pity I couldn't play those little videos uh, in Zoom because she gives a great little insight into her perspective as a student and as a past leader, uh, which is really good. I've had some funding through the uh, Griffith Group uh, Learning and Teaching, the Blended Learning Funds, and we've had some good support from people in Pebble Pad where we've presented webinars for them and so on. So I suppose the only thing I can say finally is um, I've gone a bit over time, but thank you for listening. Um, here's my details here. Uh, I do lots of other teaching and learning things. And uh, if anybody's interested in, in talking to me at any time, they can 
happily contact me through my email or whatever on. And I will thank you. I hope thank it was useful for you. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, that was very useful, interesting. Uh, thanks for your time and thanks for giving this interesting talk. Uh, usually we have a little bit of time to ask questions, <laughs> I think. Yeah, sorry. I, did, I, I, <laughs> no, I thought fine. I was going to get through that quicker um, than I actually did, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, and, um, so if, if, if uh, anybody would like to questions, you can just write them down in the chat. Um, um, well, before people think about questions, so just want to ask you a quick one. So yeah. uh, you talk about this uh, weekly um, uh, exercise, right, uh, in the Pebble Pad. Yeah. So do you actually check them or, well, because uh, if you think like it's like 400 people in the course, yeah. uh, each of them will do that. It's who a great is checking, question. Who is checking this one? Uh, I'm checking them. You like but, check like uh, all like 400 so students? You, so, so one of the things I've done is you know, I've made them non-graded. So when I'm checking through their workbooks, it's pretty easy to check in PebblePad if people have populated um, something or not. So I flick through them very quickly and I have three points where I check them, uh, three checkpoints I call them across the trimester. So I have one in week four, which I get them to have uh, the first three weeks completed and week eight, they complete weeks four to seven and in week 12 they have to complete it up to week 11 there's no extra content there's no course content in week 12 it's revision so um and what i do is i just quickly flick through and see that they've done the questions if they've populated them correctly um then they will get the non-graded mark but i will pick up and say you know i at each checkpoint, there is a set of feedback provided. And I know that some students have um, mistakes in their journals. So I highlight the fact that they need to go in. These are difficult questions. There was this calculation. I noticed some people got it wrong. Check yours, fix it up because it's a live, it's a live thing. So if I can get them to go back and revisit parts of their journal and even use them when they're studying for the final exam, um, at first, I thought it was going to be a lot of work getting through quickly checking 400 journals, but you can do it quite quickly. Um, and um, the first year it was hard work because I was building this during the trimester while we're, while we're in during COVID. And before the trimester started, I, I'd only built the first three weeks. So I was building it sort of week to week. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was probably harder work than actually going in and checking if people had populated it. Um, okay. Yes, thanks, Chris. Um, question from Paul. Um, will PebblePad be compatible with any new post blackboards? Well, I'm hoping so. And um, I'm assuming it will be because I know that um, um, the university has signed a deal with PebblePad for the next five years. So I'm assuming while we've got a license to Pebble Pad, that they'll be looking to build that into the new LMS, although we, or VLE, whatever that's going to be. I haven't heard the announcement yet. Um, I know it's close because I'm, I, I'm, um, you know, working group on hybrid teaching, uh, okay. which Nick Barter is a part of. <laughs> he said it's about to be announced, but I haven't seen it yet. So. Okay. Um, but I'm hoping that, that, I'm sure that they will have a way to incorporate it. Thanks. Um, another question from Paul. Did any students say they didn't have access to IT kit stuff, uh, poor connection and things like that? You know, it's kind of a common uh, excuse from students. Yeah, so, I didn't come across any, any um, suggestion that there was poor connectivity. I've only really, really come across that sort of stuff for my online exams when I'm running online exams and things like that, I always get students go, oh, it wouldn't let me in or I got logged off and this sort of thing. But because these are, are not, um, because they don't have, you know, specific times that they're being run and you're doing it over week to week, um, I haven't really come into those IT issues. Uh, none of the students have really alerted me. The hardest thing is like uh, a few things, like it's a, it's a little bit tricky uploading images and and actually coming across the right image files so quite often students have been taking photos with an iphone mm. and the file that it 
does is a dot H I E C or H. I don't know what it's called, but that file type won't upload into um, <laughs> it won't upload into Pebble Pad. So I've had to go and say, hey, you know, you need to convert those to a JPEG or a PNG file um, because you know otherwise they won't upload. So that that's an issue. But I think you've just got to. Uh, you just have to have that information. I've got an information sheet which has all this on it, has how to upload documents and the file types as well. Um, but, you know, you're always going to get students that miss it and then um, contact true. you and say, how do I do it? Or it won't work. Hi. Yeah, thanks. Um, just one more question from me. I think maybe sure. a quick one. Um, when you talk about um, study plans, right? So um, did you notice that um, students just copy from each other or like, did you do, I mean, uh, was it any issue with copying from each other? No, because they can actually I, like do like, I mean, like basically like they can probably like see like what other people did and or, uh, come up with like very similar plan, right? I mean, yeah, well, they can't see each other's because the workbooks ah, okay. are individual. But they can, they can uh, probably like talk to each other, right? And but say, okay, they can so talk let's, to let's each other. Okay. Um, so was there uh, any issue like with you, like about them like doing it like sort of together? Or... Uh, I didn't really see any that were copied, okay. um, you know, there, there were some that looked similar, but they were hand drawn. Mm. So, okay. you know, they still had to sit and formulate that in some way, shape or form themselves. Didn't really see a lot of that. And particularly last year, I didn't see any because last year, I think being online, a lot of the students didn't know each other. Uh, so we had that issue going on that, um, you know, I had some some students that set up study groups through, through um, meeting people in the team site I set up to try and get some social networking happening there so that students could meet each other. But I think because students didn't know each other, there was less chance of them copying. Yeah. Um, so it actually, which is, in a way, it's harder for students then, isn't it? I think a lot of the online stuff was much harder. Do you have any questions? Questions anybody would like to ask? Um, just then uh, one more from me because you know I was yeah. uh, it was really interesting to me so um, when you said that 60% uh, of uh, students uh, didn't have any uh, idea how to do these plans right so um, do you think that this like idea with like study plan will like work like really well for like first year students or we can do it let's say for like second third fourth year students or probably like first year will be yeah, just I the best I haven't thought about introducing into, into a second year course. I think, I think if we're going to do these things, we need to do them early. So I think we need to plant those seeds in first year so that they can see how they can develop a study plan and what some of the students, you know, the str learning strategies look like. And then hopefully going forward, I don't know if I, um, if I had the data on there, but not only did I ask them, did it support their learning? I also asked students um, that could they formulate a study plan if they had to do it for another course? And 80% said, yes, they could now that they've seen how to do it and, and worked it out. I mean, I'm certainly with Biochem, one of the things we have is I didn't really mention it too much, but we've got the direct entry into medicine students. So 40, 40 odd OP1 students, plus some other good students in other programs. And then we've got a lot of really low level learners and some of these first in family type people. So mm -hmm. you've got quite a contrast. So I think some of the people that I talk to about the study plans, those higher level learners are going, well, I do this already, you know, and you're forcing me to do it. I think they were the ones that were sort of, I don't need this, you know, I, I can do it myself. But I think for some of the struggling students, I think it's, it's a really important aspect I don't think it hurts those better students doing it. It's an easy task for them. Um, but I think, you know, first year is where we need to put those types of strategies. And we've got to, we've, we've got to think that they're coming to university without some of those skills. That's what, that's what I was, was um, really worried about when I saw that data, that 60% had said they'd never done a plan before. It seems a bit high to me, 
Um, I looked at the data last year and it was still 54% for 2020 that said they'd never done a study plan before. And I asked them either at school or another university or another, you know, learning institution and they just said no. Um, so it, it's, as I said, it just seems a bit high to me that they've never done that before throughout their education. Well, thanks, Chris. Uh, well, if uh, no more questions, I guess we'll just uh, conclude the seminar. Usually we finish at 1 p.m. or before 1 p.m., but <laughs> there was... Sorry about that. <laughs> no, My fault for going no, too long. Uh, it was actually like very interesting and uh, useful because uh, we have uh, similar problems in uh, engineering. We have also first year courses that have very high failure rate, um, especially math. So like mm -hmm. we have about like you're talking about 25 27 percent failure rate and we have like very similar percentage too <laughs> so, yeah well, and we're also trying to change uh it, like give them more uh, tutorials and videos and things like that so you have also very interesting uh, approach about this um uh, journals and, and the study plan definitely something that we should probably also consider i think one of the problems is that you know you can you can give them lots of resources but you have to get them to use the resources. Yeah, if you don't put like uh, any uh, mark on that uh, uh, resources, so uh, they uh, won't actually like use it because they be like, oh, whatever, because uh, there is no like mark, no grade for that one. Yeah. Yeah, so actually I have to like uh, force them <laughs> to like use uh, these resources sort of, right? Make them do that. Yeah. by um making them as uh, like sort of like part of assessment plan yeah well yeah um, we have like very similar experience in uh, engineering yeah. so <laughs> oh, i'm sure there's Universal. a similar experience uh, across lots of different disciplines yeah. and and across a lot of the stem disciplines but yeah yeah i think um yeah if you're going the problem is that if there's no assessment attached to it or no grade weighting attached yeah. to it then they won't do it yeah, yeah, that's true. So, yeah. so that's the hardest part. And, and you know, for for what I do, I, I've sort of, you know, it hasn't really affected, um, it hasn't really changed. You know, it's not, not elevating students to a pass when they don't deserve it. Uh, I'm very critical that we don't go down that road because we have to maintain a certain standard. I'm sure engineering's the same. Yeah. We, we have to have a certain standard, you, you know, if these people are going to go off into a, their uh, jobs and they're designing bridges and buildings or whatever, um, we can't afford to compromise the quality the, of the students that are coming through. We have to make sure that they can do those, have those skills um, to be successful. Well, thanks, uh, thanks Chris, for your time. Thanks for a very interesting presentation. Um, uh, Yep. Thank you, everybody, for listening, and thanks for the invitation. Um, I hope it's been applicable across. Um, yeah, it is. You know, I'm sure there's some similarities across engineering with sciences. It's they're not much different in the way that we probably teach and 